I'm Glenn Moots, professor here at Northwood University and director of the university's Forum for Citizenship and Enterprise. Uh, we are an academic center which since 2009 has provided an ongoing series of programs relevant to our vocations in business and civic life. We have one more program this semester and it's a little different than the one you've seen on the flyers. We had scheduled a debate on the American founding, but unfortunately one of our uh, debaters has had a uh, family emergency. So on the 16th, we'll still be in here at 7 o'clock, our speaker will be Jeff Day, who is CEO of Blue Water Technologies Group in Southfield, and he'll be speaking on the experience economy. Why care? Why now? So that'll be, again, November 16th in here at 7 o'clock. I hope you'll join us for that. And we're going to try to reschedule that debate on the founding for uh, next semester. Also, if you look on the screen, you'll see a mini URL that you can use on your phone, tablet, or computer. And students, it's imperative that we get your feedback. We want your feedback on this program, and so does our co-sponsor, the Institute for Humane Studies. And that uh, code will, that the mini URL will be up uh, after the program and also during Q&A as well. The Institute for Humane Studies, our co-sponsor, ad advances a freer society by facilitating uh, scholars and students like you who share an interest in liberty. And if you have questions about IHS programs, please contact me and I'll be happy to assist you. In fact, we have a program coming up on November 18th. Um, if you're interested in that, that's a Saturday program. Tonight, we engage not only one of the big questions of the moment, but one of the big questions of the future. Islam is not only the second largest religion, it is the fastest growing religious group in the world. According to the Pew Research Center, Muslim populations will grow twice as fast as the overall world population over the next half century and will, by the second half of this century, likely become the world's largest religious group nearly three billion, or just under one-third of the projected total population. Muslim populations are younger and have more children, sometimes twice as many as their neighbors in Europe, for example. These are more than just demographic data points. Islamic countries are destinations for American intervention. Islam is the catalyst motivating controversies over immigration, nationalism, and travel in the West. The world may soon contend with a new nuclear power in Iran, and Islam has been claimed as the motivation of violent terrorist and revolutionary groups who are changing everyday life around the world. Muslims around the world also offer competing visions of law, community, and society that may seem strange or foreign, including to some of you here. As you know, here at Northwood, we are concerned about freedom, free markets, individual responsibility, and limited government. We support the kinds of freedoms protected in our Constitution and Bill of Rights, descending back to a long tradition of law and liberty in the Western world. And to that end, we ask the question, is Islam compatible with a free society? Our ensuing discussion tonight is free from the bloviating of politicians and talking heads motivated by an honest look at the meaning of Islam and of freedom. And we have with us three scholars exceedingly qualified to answer the question. Mustafa Akil, Saeed Khan, and Daniel Philpon. Our discussion tonight will be moderated by Lee Trepanier. We will hear from our panelists and then from you. It is our intention that you leave here better informed than you came in, but are able to understand the role that Islam plays not only now, but in the future. So I will begin by introducing our moderator, and he will introduce our panelists. They will uh, speak for a little over an hour, and then we'll move to discussion among the panelists and Q&A with the audience. Our entire program will run no longer than 9 p.m., and after that, we'll have refreshments in the upstairs lobby. I hope you'll join us, although I think we're going to run out of cake. So <laughs> if you really want cake, get there soon. Um, so with that, let me introduce our moderator, Professor Lee Trepanier is Professor of Political Science at Saginaw Valley State University. He is editor of the Lexington Books, Politics, Literature, and Film Series, and the editor of the website Vogelin View. He is the auditor, uh, excuse me, author or editor of 20 books, the latest being Why the Humanities Matter in Defense of Liberal Education. 
With that, I will turn it over to him. Please join me in welcoming Professor Elitra Panier and our panelists. Thank you, Glenn. I just want to take a moment to thank Norfolk University, the Forum, uh, IHS, and our esteemed guests here tonight to speak, as well as you in the audience. Our first speaker tonight is Mustafa Akko. He is a Turkish journalist and author who studied political science and history at Baghazi University. He's been a columnist in the national Turkish newspaper and since the fall of 2013, a regular contributor opinion writer for the New York Times. He has published six books in Turkish. In 2011, his book, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, was published in the United States and nominated for the Lionel Gilbert Prize at the University of Toronto. He's also author of The Islamic Jesus, How the King of the Jews Became a Prophet of the Muslims in 2017. It was both, the book was both praised by the New York Times and the National Catholic Reporter. He has given hundreds of lectures and talks on numerous platforms, including a TED Talk on faith, versus Tradition of Islam, which is available on YouTube. I would encourage you all to go and see it. And since 20, January 2017, he's a visiting, visiting, senior visiting fellow at the Freedom Project at Wesley College. Please welcome Mr. Gustav Alcom. Do you have a mic here? Oh, yeah. Right there. Oh. Oh, it's here already. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> well, good evening, and thank you so much for uh, coming here tonight. And of course, thanks a lot for the you know Northwood University for hosting me here, bringing me all the way from Boston. And and you know, thanks for you know coming here rather than doing more fun things out there uh, tonight. And and it's it's happy to be here. Uh, I'm from Turkey, and I'm a writer who spent a lot of ink on the matters of the Muslim world. And uh, this is a big question tonight we're, we're going to discuss. Is Islam compatible with a free society? And I'll give an answer, but before that, I want to tell you a few personal stories, which might bring some you know, personal insights to this matter. And I'll tell you two different stories. One is nicer, the other one is a little more complicated. But at the end of which, I think I'll uh, come to a few points. One is a personal story I want to tell you, and that is, coming back from the very first trip I had to the United States some 20 years ago from Turkey. 20 years ago, I was a younger man, less white hair, and I was excited to see America, the land of Rocky Balboa for me. <laughs> I was in my mid-20s, you know, and, and I, there was a friend of mine who was already in the U.S. He said, hey, come over. Come for a summer holiday and let's hang out. I said, yes, I got a visa. I came to US. And he took me around. We went from New York to California, different places. I was excited with everything I saw. And one morning we were hungry and he said, uh, let's have breakfast. I said, okay. He said, let's go and eat at the McDonald's. I said, like, will we eat burgers for breakfast? He said, no, no. McDonald's has breakfast. I said, okay, let me see what that is. And we went in, and he bought me a breakfast menu, full menu. And that was the first time in my life that I saw pancakes. We didn't have pancakes in Turkey in the 90s. <coughs> so he showed me how to put the syrup and the butter, and it sucked all of it, and I tasted it, and I said, man, this is the most delicious thing I ever had in my life. <laughs> I instantly fell in love with pancakes. Right? So I went back to Turkey. Next summer holiday, I came to the US again. And I was willing to have pancakes, right? But I had a little misunderstanding. I was thinking that pancakes are an exclusive McDonald's product. <laughs> so I was trying to find a McDonald's restaurant before 10.30 AM, because I had figured out that they change into lunch many at 10.30, to get the pancakes. And it went on for a few days. And it was, I think, the last day, third day, I was walking in Manhattan, and I was looking for another McDonald's place, just for change, you know. And I saw a non-McDonald's restaurant, which wrote, we serve pancakes. I said, ah, they stole it from McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 
it went on for a while, but I ultimately realized that you know, pancakes are a larger phenomenon than McDonald's itself, and you can find it everywhere. And years later, I took a lesson from that story, and the story was that a foreign culture might be a little confusing when you meet it for the first time. Uh, you might misunderstand some peculiarities, and if a foreign culture, you know, I mean, if you misunderstand some like cuisine or food, I mean, pancakes, baklavas, it's not that big of a problem. You know, you'll figure out as I did. But if we tend to have misperceptions about a different society, a different civilization, about their values, about their politics, about their religion, that is sometimes a bigger gap to fill. And I personally think that we are in this modern age, in the early 20th century, very prone to have sometimes misperceptions about different cultures, precisely because of the media, which brings us a lot of information about those cultures, right? I mean, you go to, you go home, open your breaking news, and you get, you know, news from all over the world every second, right? So bombing here, some, some terror attack there, some bad thing happening in some parts of the world, from societies that you have never seen. But never forget, what you're seeing is the shocking, the disturbing, the, the outrageous. So bad people in those societies, the fanatics, the militants, which are there, they make the news, they make the headlines. But normal people who are living a normal life don't create headlines. So sometimes you don't have a, have a perception about them. So that is, I think, one thing that has made, uh, unfortunately, painted a wrong image of Islam uh, to some Westerners, understandably, from 9-11, that horrific day in which 3,000 Muslims in America were more murdered uh, by a bunch of terrorists. So th there has been, there is a problem of militancy within the Muslim world today, but that has become the lens sometimes through which we see Islam. And I think that is a misperception. Let me tell you one more thing. The same dynamic is working on the other side as well. I mean, when people hear the breaking news from the West in the Middle East, they don't hear the nicest, most likable, tolerant narratives coming out. They hear also what is shocking and disturbing. Like I, uh, to figure this out, I made a research um, in 2012 to figure out which American religious figure appeared most frequently in the Turkish media. And the research, which I'll admit was simple, it was a Google search. You know, that <laughs> I just typed the word pastor to figure out. And it turned out that the most frequently quoted American religious figure in the Turkish media was the gentleman from Florida who wanted to burn a copy of the Quran. And I understand it's his constitutional right, as people respect people's freedom of expression, but you can use your freedom of expression in a respectful way, in a sometimes disturbing way, he used it in a disturbing way, and he created an image. He was on the news all the time. I remember a Turkish newspaper headline saying, now they are burning our Quran. It was not they, it was just one man in a, you know, head of a small denomination, and many mainstream Christian leaders disapprove that. So, there's a t this dynamic. And when we're looking into a different religion, we should first put that aside. And let's try to understand the nuances, because there are always nuances. There's always a spectrum. And I would say the problem with violent extremists, terrorists, like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, these horrific groups, this is a burning problem, but this is also a very, very marginal problem. The people who have sympathy for ISIS and Al-Qaeda are very marginal, very small groups in the Muslim world. And they typically come from some political fanaticism and some, some political madness, some anger, and so on and so forth, which can never be justified for any, of course, terrorism. But it is a marginal problem, and that should not be the lens through which we see Islam. It's more of a political problem. From in, in, in the geographies that you right, see the emergence of these militant groups three generations ago, two generations ago, there were communist groups, again, mobilizing for some political sort of radicalism. So it, these were mostly political issues. Uh, but I should say, while the extremism problem is relatively marginal, marginal, there is a broader problem that I personally engage with very much to you know, tackle and, and to question, and that is the authoritarianism problem, that I, that's what I call it. In other words, when you go to Muslim countries today, mainstream Muslim countries, like Iran, or, well, Iran is very unusual, let's not get into that, but especially in the US in the context. Let's say you go to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is not a terrorist state. I mean, it is a state, you know, it's actually an ally of the US. 
But if you go to Saudi Arabia and promote religious freedom, it will not be very welcome. Even in some mainstream, even relatively more moderate Muslim countries, it can be a problem. So therefore I say while the extremism terrorism problem is a relatively marginal problem, there is a broader problem in today mainstream Islam about authoritarianism, about authoritarianism in the name of religion. And to explain what it exactly is, I'll give you a, another story of mine, the second story, which is not as nice as the pancake story, but uh, it is, I think, also interesting. This is just three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, I was in Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia. I don't know if you've been to Kuala Lumpur, but it's pretty far from here. It is the exact other end of the planet, like 12 hours of homes. And I went there for a few events because a liberal Muslim group, and by liberal I mean classical liberal Muslim group who believes in freedom of speech and freedom of religion, they had invited me to give panels to different, uh, to, to, to basically Malay Muslim audience. And one event was about apostasy, the right to apostatize from Islam. Like, can you leave Islam and take another religion? I was, the, I was one of the speakers of the event. And I said, well, if people want to change their religion, as Muslims, we can be sorry for them. We can think that they're leaving the throat. You know, we might try to convince them, but we should not punish them for that. Because in Saudi Arabia, they punish those people, they send them to jail. Malaysia, Malaysia is moderate, so they don't send them to jail, they send them to a rehabilitation center. So I said, you shouldn't send people to a rehabilitation center. You can offer rehabilitation if they really want it, but you know, you can't force people for that. So I made this argument, and I remember I say, I said, religion is not something you can police. And I, I referred to the Quranic verse, a very important Quranic statement, which reads, La in Arabic, which means no compulsion in religion. Yes, there's a like, verse like that in the Quran, which says no compulsion in religion. I said, we should take the Quran seriously on this matter, so we should not police religion. So it was a nice panel like this, you know, a lot of people, and I, we had cookies, even actually. And at the end, uh, something happened which wouldn't probably happen here. I, I'm just keeping fingers crossed. A group of people came and they said, are you Mustafa Akio? And I said, yes. They said, we need to talk to you. I said, who are you? They said, we are the religion police. Said, oh, okay, you're the guys that talked about it. Okay. <laughs> so they showed me their identity card. It's, it wrote religion enforcement police. And they heard complaints about my talk. They, they also heard that I spoke without <coughs> proper authorization from the authorities, which is a legal necessity in Malaysia, but how they interpret that is a complicated issue. They asked questions, they let me go, but the next day, I thought the issue was over. I was at the airport and I gave my you know, passport to the police and I was hoping that I'll go to a lounge and rest and you know, get some massage, you know, the Eastern way, the Asian way or something. They actually detained me. You know, they said, well, you can go. They took me to a room and they, are, they arrested me. They, they read an arrest warrant to my face, which is quite an experience. And I heard that, well, it's three years in jail if you do that in Malaysia, go out and speak without the authorities permission and so on and so forth. I spent the whole night in jail. Luckily, they let me go thanks to some diplomacy the next day. And I was able to fly back to US like 24 hours later. So it was a wow kind of experience. I was detained by the religion police and let go. And I wrote about it for, on this issue for the New York Times. If you want to see like the rest of the story, you can find it there. But one thing that struck me that whole, in that whole experience was very something very important. <coughs> I quoted the Quran, which reads, no compulsion in religion. That is one of the verses which the more, let's say, reform-minded, the more, let's say, liberal-minded, liberal in a classical broad sense, Muslims typically quote. We say, the Quran says, no compulsion in religion. So you should not have a religion police. You should not force people to be Muslims or remain in Islam, or you shouldn't have religion police. So, so that's an argument for freedom based on the Quran. They were so angry for quoting, uh, quoting me. They were so angry at me for quoting that verse in the Quran. They said, you don't have the right to interpret that verse. And I, once they let me go at the airport, I checked how they interpret the verse. I checked their website, the Jakim, you know, you can do it. You know, it's a, not a very nice website, but you go, can go there. Find an English interpretation of the Quran. And they, they put the no compulsion words as it is, but they put parentheses into it. And the parentheses reads, 
No compulsion in religion in becoming a Muslim. That's an insertion into the words. No compulsion in religion in becoming a Muslim. Hmm. Now, why do they say that? Because they don't accept the words as it is, which seems to imply that religion should not be coerced. They only accept the fact that, OK, you can't force non-Muslims to become a Muslim. But once you become a Muslim, and if you become an apostate, we will send you to a rehabilitation center. Or if you're a Muslim, and if you speak without authority's permission, like I did, we can you know, punish you for that. Or we can police you, like we can have religion police checking how pious you are. But that is interesting that that is not in the Quranic words. They add an insertion to it. It is in some medieval jurisprudence, but that's not there. And, and the argument I made for religious freedom was based on Islam, was based on the Quran. And here was an authoritarian institution, an Islamic institution, which was persecuting me for that. Now, this is just one example of the diversity you will see now in the Islamic world today. If you ask the question, is Islam compatible with a free society? I'll tell you, yes. My Islam, my wife's Islam, my wife's from Bosnia, they don't have religion police there. In Turkey, we have other problems, but we don't have religion police. It's not a blasphemy to criticize religion in Turkey, it's a blasphemy to criticize the president, which is a different topic. <laughs> but so, like here, yes, of course, I mean, you can be a Muslim, you can observe, you can wear your headscarf if you want to, you will refrain from eating pork, or you know, it's, it's up to you, it's between your, you and your relationship with God. That is one Muslim hood which is out there. And there are so many Muslims who are already living in Western societies who appreciate the freedoms they find here. They're conservative, observant, with different levels of you know, degree. And those people think, yes, Islam is compatible with a free society. They want a free society. They want freer societies back at home. But if you ask the Malaysian religion police, they say no. You know, they actually condemn liberalism, pluralism, and human rights ism as if it's an ideology. I mean, for them it is. So here you have other Muslims who are saying no. Because in the past century, in the past two centuries, the Islamic world has, is going through a discussion that took place in other religious traditions as well. Now, uh, Christians don't burn heretics at the stake anymore, but there was a time some Christians did that. There was a time, you know, called the Inquisition. I mean, there was a time that some Christians thought that you should use coercion for religion. You should punish the heretics, or you should, you know, punish people for their wrong ideas, or you should ban books or burn books. So that was a very popular idea among some Christians in what we call the Middle Ages. Christianity went through that. There was been a lot of experiments with, with different kinds of rights and wrongs. Ultimately, some Christians said this is wrong, so there was a there was a progress towards a more free society. And it happened gradually. It happened with Protestantism. It happened with Catholicism. So today, I can say Christianity is a religion that has, by and large, made its peace with an open free society, even defenders of that, especially regarding religious freedom. So that's something I admire. And I think there are a lot of ideas we should learn from that. In the Muslim world, the debate is still going on. And there are people who think that, oh, religion cannot be tolerated. There are people who think, sorry, I mean, different religions cannot be tolerated, or well, we, we can't tolerate apostasy, we can't tolerate sin. So, and you have authoritarian institutions, authoritarian regimes, and there are people who are struggling against that. Now, this is a battle, and it will be with us for a while. This is a battle that will take time. I'm not going to change the Malaysian authorities' minds by going there once more time and giving another panel, which I don't plan, by the way. I mean, do a Skype connection through it. <laughs> or there are many other Muslims, I mean, speaking for progress and change and, 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 and for, and they are not, don't forget, they're not Muslims who say, they're not ex-Muslims. I mean, there are people who are ex-Muslims too, I, I respect their point of view too, but these are not ex-Muslims. These are people who claim Islam from the authoritarian interpretation because they say, what you're doing there is not in the Quran, but what you're doing there is not actually how you would understand the Prophet's example. So it's a debate going on within Islam. And it, it's an inter-Islamic issue, it will go on. And probably there's not much outsiders can do. But if, there, if there's one mistake, what the outsiders can make, non-Muslims can make, is to make the pancakes mistake. To think that, oh, the bad guys here are the only authentic ones. 
they actually define the whole tradition. To think that the extremists, or let alone extremists, the authoritarians, define what is Islam. And I sometimes see people thinking like that, and people wanting to believe like that. And I sometimes see people say, Islam is a violent authoritarian religion that would not allow any freedom, and so on and so forth. And I say, thank you for fully agreeing with the Malaysian religion police and Saudi authorities and confirming their point of view while we are arguing against that. So I think from the outside point of view, the best thing to do would be to see the diversity, see the battles, and watch it, and maybe contribute it with, like, with, with facilitating some dialogue, and contribute it, with, like, contribute it with having amazing events, like we're having tonight at Northwood. So thank you so much for that, for this mm. opportunity. Thank you so much for this attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is Saeed A. Khan, a senior lecturer at the Department of Near East and Asian Studies and Global Studies at Wayne State University and a fellow at the Center for the Study of Citizenship. He is also an honorary fellow at the Australian Catholic University at Melbourne and a senior research fellow at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, a Michigan-based think tank. He has founded the Center for Study of the Transatlantic Disparities think tank and policy center that compares the conditions of ethnic immigrants groups in North America and Europe. Professor Khan has been a contributor to C-SPAN, NPR, Voice of America, the National Press Club, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and the BBC. His essays and studies have been published in a variety of edited collections, and he serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Islamic Law and Culture. We welcome Professor Khan. Thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you, Glenn, uh, for the kind invitation and the really awesome dinner, except, I don't know, now I'm hungry for pancakes. Um, <laughs> you know, filet mignon, pancakes. Uh, and as well as uh, Northwood University, uh, the forum, and IHS. And also, I'm, I'm always uh, humbled by a crowd like this on a, uh, on a weeknight. Uh, I guess Grey's Anatomy's done. <laughs> Uh, thank you to Mustafa for both uh, impressing me and making me hungry. Uh, not with the story about Kuala Lumpur, but about pancakes. Um, wow. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about this place called IHOP. Uh, I discovered that. Okay. okay. Good, good. My work is done then. Uh, Mustafa was really helpful in providing for you I think of an important idea of showing how diverse this otherwise solid structure known as Islam really is. And if you ask any four Muslims, what does Islam mean, you're going to get about 13 different interpretations about it. And that's in five minutes. If the conversation goes a little bit longer, uh, you're going to find many more permutations about it. And I would argue, uh, looking at it from a different perspective as far as what tonight's discussion is, that free society, in many ways, has to be seen through the same lens. If I were to ask all of you, and given your numbers, we might be here all night if I did, uh, taking a poll of what are the features of free society, I am sure that we're going to get several dozen different interpretations or prioritizations of what factors make a free society. We all have an idea of what free means and, of course, what society means. Uh, but you see that this is a much, much more uh, complex issue. Now, I grew up for the first eight years of my life in England, and uh, for the rest of my life, I won't tell you how long, in uh, the United States. And if you're wondering what happened to the accent, uh, New York, uh, when I was eight years old, happened. Because uh, when you're speaking with a British accent on the playgrounds of Queens, and you're accused for the first three weeks in a row of being a posh Puerto Rican, uh, there weren't too many South Asians back in 1975 in, uh, in, the, in, in New York, so that was the closest thing they could go ahead and accuse me of being. I said, yeah, I think I'll lose the accent until the next time I visit London. Uh, the Canadian scholar Charles Taylor uh, has talked about what he sees as the central features, not of free society, but of Western modernity. And notice how it's so convenient and easy for us to make that inferential leap or put that equal sign between Western modernity and free society as though these things are completely synonymous. He says that the three features 
our economy, which he essentializes as being capitalist free market, the public sphere, and self-governance. So in asking the question not so much whether Islam is compatible with free uh, society, let's at least go ahead and see if Islam is compatible with Western modernity. Because the one thing that we can say with all surety is that we live in Western modernity. Well, as far as the economy is concerned, uh, Islam actually started off within a very capitalistic society. Mecca in the 7th century of the Common Era was all about trade. And in fact, it was exactly because of the trade and the commerce that was bustling in places like Mecca and Medina that allowed Islam to then springboard around the peninsula and within 50 years become a tri-continental force. Uh, many people like to say that Islam spread by the sword. It actually spread by the caravan. Uh, and it's interesting also to know that in the 19th century, Mughal India, which was India ruled by a, uh, a Muslim dynasty, was the wealthiest country on earth. It constituted for 27% of the global wealth. So for a religion that is sometimes considered to be antithetical to the West, and particularly this concept of economy, which so many people hold dear and even sacred, Clearly we see that eco uh, economics, different economic models, and wealth per se, is not something that Muslims shy away from. Uh, Mansa Musa, who was the king of Mali in the 14th century, was the wealthiest man who ever lived. I mean, take Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Carlos Slim in Mexico, and 10 or 12 other people combined, and you wouldn't have the wealth of Mansa Musa. When he was traveling to the pilgrimage in Arabia, he went through Cairo and had so much gold that he devalued the economy of uh, Egypt just by the simple fact of how much money he had. So clearly we see then that economics is not really a, uh, uh, a disqualifier for Muslims. When it comes to the public sphere, the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas has done a lot of work on this, and I'll spare you uh, going into too much uh, uh, detail about Habermas, but if you ever see Muslims uh, gathered, uh, their idea of a public sphere is anywhere there's a cup of coffee, and they will go ahead and have some of the most lively and active debates. And they will debate anything and everything for you. So the idea that they are sheltered in going ahead and engaging in the kinds of conversations which make a vibrant society just doesn't happen. Ask anybody who has a Muslim mom. Uh, third is the idea of self-governance. Now, self-governance may not necessarily mean a full democracy. It may be a representative form of government. But again, here we find that when it comes to Islam, when it comes to Muslims, given the fact that democracy right now is the dominant political system uh, in Western modernity, there are several Muslim countries that are, in fact, democracies. Unfortunately, as Mustafa said, Media narrowing tends to then focus on certain countries which aren't, particularly monarchies like uh, Saudi Arabia. But I'm going to go ahead and give you four countries and see if you can come up with a common denominator. Pakistan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Turkey. Any ideas? Other than the fact that their national dish is not pancakes. <laughs> They're all Muslim. They're all Muslim. Anything else? They've all had, uh, they're, they're not only uh, democratic, but they've all had women as prime ministers. Pakistan had Benazir Bhutto, Indonesia had uh, Megawati Sukarno Putri, Bangladesh has had two, Khalid Zia, as well as Sheikha Hanika Hasina, and Turkey, of course, had Tansu Chiller back in the mid-1990s. I'm trying to remember when the United States had a female prime minister or president. I mean, you can, you can tell me offline on that one. Uh, so if we take a look at what Taylor is saying, as far as what not only defines Western modernity and by extension free society, are these compatible with Islam? I think we've now uh, come to the conclusion that that's an emphatic yes. But to be fair, I think we're not only looking at Islam from being a religious system. You know, when we think about Islam, of course, it is a theology, it is a faith which 1.7 billion uh, people uh, hold on to. 
Perhaps by the end of tonight's session, it'll be up to 1.8 billion, who knows? Uh, but what we find, though, is that along with that, there is a culture to Islam. There is a sociology to Islam. And as a result of it, we have to understand that that's where you see the variation. Clearly, somebody can go ahead and say that these are the religious tenets, and even the religious tenets will go ahead and allow for something. But in many societies that have a rock, scissors, paper kind of relationship with authority, and as Mustafa was alluding to, mechanisms of social control, religion is not the only one. You have culture, you also have politics, or the state that is trying to exert itself. And the one and best way that you can go ahead and exert social control, whether it is in the state, whether it is in a community, or whether it is even in the home, is say that God said you can't do this. Clearly, for those of you who are much younger than I, you probably have more recent memory of asking your parents for something and your parents said no, and the answer might simply have been why, and they said because. Uh, they might expand on that and say, well, because I told you. Or they might find some other authority, usually a higher authority, by which they can go ahead and justify it. So it's important to see that how cultural Islam then plays a big role in shaping the idea of how free a society uh, people want it to be. Now one of the defining features also of Western modernity is the nation state. And we take it for granted because basically it's the only system that we've ever known when it comes to our social political engagement. But the nation state is actually not that old when you think about human history. The nation state is actually only about 469 years old. It's uh, actually younger than Harvard University. Uh, Harvard was formed in 1636. The concept of the modern nation state comes about in 1648. And the rationale for it is actually at the end of war. The 30-year war in Europe, which was fought a century after the religious uh, Protestant Reformation. While Halak, who's at Columbia University, not a Muslim, mind you, but one of the foremost experts on Islamic law, wrote in his book, The Impossible State, that the modern state is a bad fit for Muslims, but not because the modern state is necessarily a free society, but because the modern state places primacy on the political and the economic, and that runs or rubs against the spiritual nature of what Muslims would consider to be the priority. And it's a rather audacious argument that he makes, because when many people read this book, they think, aha, what he's essentially saying is that Muslims really can't live in a nation state, they can't live in modernity. But he's giving the reasons why this is problematic for them, and the reasons, I think, are a lot more nuanced than people would otherwise give credit. Now, I mentioned that the nation state is 469 years old. I'm not sure how much we, living in the 21st century, can place a wager to say that the nation state will be around for another 469 years. The forces of globalization now are creating post-national realities. And so, for example, the European Union, the Gulf Cooperation Council, all of these conventions no longer make the nation state the basic building block of social political engagement. And if you want to see why people are getting a little bit antsy about it, it's because they're wondering where are the structures and the borders and the security blanket of a nation state. It's how you can then explain hyper-nationalistic politicians, like in the case of Turkey, uh, Prime Minister or President Erdogan, in the case of India, Narendra Modi, in the case of the Philippines, Duterte, some might even argue right here at home with the phenomenon of President Trump. Well, why then these distinctions, why these differences when it comes to how people perceive Islam and Muslims and their place within a free society? Well, when it comes to the American context, I think it's important to take a look at what have been the influencers of the American thinking process when it comes to politics. And of course, most of you are familiar with one of the greatest influences on the Founding Fathers, and that's John Locke. And Locke, in 1689, in his letter concerning toleration, and if you'll bear with me, I've actually got this quoted, because contrary to what you might think, I don't go around memorizing Locke. Uh, he said that, quote, that church or religion can have no right to be tolerated by the magistrate or government which is constituted upon such a bottom, i.e. foundation, 
me, I guess that's how they wrote that then, uh, that all those who enter it to do thereby ipso facto deliver themselves up, up to the protection and services of another prince, foreign ruler. It is ridiculous for anyone to pr profess himself to be a Muslim, only in his religion, but in everything else a faithful subject to a Christian mag magistrate, while at the same time he acknowledges himself bound to yield blind obedience to the Mufti of Constantinople, who himself is entirely obedient to the Ottoman Emperor, or Caliph, and frames the feigned oracles or commandments of that religion according to his pleasure. Now I read that, and yes, it made my eyes glaze over as well, but I saw at least two spectacular flaws in Locke's thinking. The Ottoman Empire was a phenomenon that lasted from the early 14th century until 1918, spanning three continents. And he's talking about some very specific terminology. He mentions Mufti. And the Mufti of Constantinople, which then became Istanbul, and he really should have called it Istanbul because that was its name in 1689, was the highest ranking religious authority within uh, the Ottoman Empire. But he was a political appointment. He was not somebody who had ultimate authority. And while Locke is sitting here saying that he was subservient to the caliph, the political authority of the Ottoman Empire and the Muslim world writ large, uh, yeah, he actually wasn't. The Sultan, in fact, was bound to enforce the religious interpretation of the Mufti. Consider the caliph then to be, in American terms, the head of the executive branch, which, as you know, is responsible for the enforcement of law. So taking a look then at what was the structure in the mind of somebody as exalted as John Locke when he was trying to understand Islam and some of the very foundational tenets of relationships between religion and politics, it's no wonder then that some of our founding fathers were influenced by alternate facts. It shows though a very sophisticated system within Islam of what we know and what we hold dear to be separation of powers. It's also important to see that the language of Locke, if we were to go ahead and speed up time, would sound eerily like arguments that were being made in the United States in the year 1960, in this case about John F. Kennedy. Whether or not, instead of the Mufti of Constantinople, Kennedy was going to take his marching orders from the Pope sitting at the Vatican. Now, as far as the caliphate as an institution goes, which was never technically a religious or a theological institution, it was abolished by act of Turkish parliament in 1924. And one of the arguments that's being made right now and debated in the Muslim world is, were there to be a caliphate, meaning a legitimate one, not some guy in Iraq claiming to be the caliph, would there then be a centering phenomenon for Muslims? Would there be a sense of consensus? And I think we're still probably about 100 years away from coming up with an answer, so I wouldn't really worry too much about that. I like to take a look at examples of free society and hold a mirror up to them regarding their own values. One country which, of course, espouses, and I'm sure most of you would agree, is the epitome of free society, is our neighbor to the south, Canada. Uh, only people in Michigan get that because, as you know, Windsor, Ontario is south of Detroit, uh, first country south. Uh, Quebec, which, yes, is part of Canada, uh, just recently passed Bill 62, in which they are seeking to ban the niqab, the full face veil for Muslim women. And by the way, there is no big epidemic of Muslim women wearing the niqab in Quebec. But the, the rationale for doing so is interesting. On the one hand, they're saying that we need to save and preserve uh, the culture of Quebec from this false and illegitimate infiltration and encroachment. Uh, if that's the case, then they really should do a better job banning English in Quebec, uh, because that's far more pernicious than anything that a face veil uh, wearing Muslim is going to do. But they also use the rationale that they're trying to save the women from themselves, <laughs> as if they have asked or pleaded for that kind of liberation. And this conceit is fairly commonplace in Europe today, 
if you listen to the language which is used, and I was in Amsterdam a, uh, a couple of years ago having uh, breakfast, no pancakes. Actually, they have those small pancakes there, the profiteroles. Um, you can, when you go to the lounge in Amsterdam, you should try that. Yeah. Uh, not McDonald's, though. Uh, and uh, here are some people who saw themselves as very enlightened by their own definition, uh, University of Amsterdam scholars. And they kept dropping this word called emancipation. Well, the Muslims in the Netherlands are becoming emancipated. And that is the great promise for their integration into Dutch society. Now, the word emancipation for us in the United States has a totally different connotation. It makes you think of roots. It makes you think of 12 Years a Slave. It makes you think of Lincoln and probably three or four other movies that I can just uh, rattle right off there. But the idea of freedom, especially from bondage and slavery, and then I realized that the Europeans use it in sort of the same fashion. They see the emancipation of Muslims now as Europe saw the emancipation of Jews 200 years ago, as in the case of France with Napoleon in 1806, as a way to liberate these people from themselves, from a purportedly oppressive culture, an oppressive religion, and all of a sudden if they eat Gouda cheese and like windmills and uh, okay. uh, wear clogs, somehow or the other they have become woke. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a fascinating way of how Europe sees itself. Nicolas Sarkozy, who was the president of France, decided that it was his imperative to go out and ban the niqab to save French women. In fact, if anything, he proved himself to be more patriarchal than even some people in Afghanistan. But there's also a hypocrisy when it comes to free society in France. Why is it that a woman who is wearing the, the, the headscarf, not even fully veiled, who goes into a discount clothing store in Paris and spends 20 euros, is all of a sudden an existential threat to French society. But a woman from Qatar or the United Arab Emirates who is in full veil on the Champs-Élysées and goes into Hermès or Christian Dior and drops 200,000 euros on haute couture, she's welcomed with a red carpet. Something to consider about when we see what that free society means. When it comes to then the negotiations of where is the fit between Islam and free society, uh, as much as it's important to take a look at what does Islam say theologically, there's the need to go ahead and understand that in this rather diverse community of Muslims that globalization is bringing us in greater contact with, we're going to understand how their religion is refracted through culture, through a myriad of political systems, some of which are imposed upon them, in deciding exactly to what extent and to what degree either they want to be free or we will allow them to be free. Thank you. Finally, our last speaker is Daniel Zopak, a professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. He earned a doctorate from Harvard in 1996 and a scholar of religion and global politics. He's written on religion and influence and the rise of the sovereign state system, religious freedom, reconciliation, and on the determinants of behavior of religious actors in global politics. Among his books are Just and Unjust Peace, Ethics of Political Reconciliation, Nicole authored God's Century, Resurgent Religion in Global Politics. In the, act in the activist vein, he has promoted faith-based reconciliation in Kashmir and the Great Lakes region of Africa. Please welcome Professor Popak. Thank you for having me, and I apologize for struggling with a cold here. I'm a little bit hoarse, but I'll try to speak through it. I'm honored to be here. Thank you to the Institute. Thank you to all of you for coming out on a rainy night. Also honored to be here with Mustafa Akil, one of my great heroes, a courageous witness for uh, freedom, and uh, Saeed Khan, who I'm coming to know with a great appreciation for his uh, views and uh, efforts as well. The subject of this forum, is Islam compatible with a free society? It's also the subject of a culture war that has been roiling in the West over Islam. It has played out again and again on cable news, talk radio, the internet, and in newspapers, at least as far back as September 11, 2001, 
And indeed, every time Islam appears to be in some way linked with violence. The murder of the Dutch filmmaker Theo van Gogh, Al Qaeda's bombings in Madrid and London, Danish cartoons mocking the Prophet Muhammad, Iraq, Afghanistan, the Regensburg Address of Pope Benedict XVI, the building of an Islamic community center in Lower Manhattan, the Arab uprisings of 2011, shootings at Fort Hood and in San Bernardino, the predations of Boko Haram and the Islamic State. In this culture war, I'm talking about the West here, you hear it when you turn on the radio. There are hawks and there are doves. Sorry, I need, a, I need an advance here. Okay, great. Hawks hold that violence and tolerance are widespread in Islam. That Islam is hardwired for these pathologies through its texts and traditions. That Islam is inhospitable to liberal democracy and that the West must gird up for a long struggle against Islam's threat. Doves hold that Islam is pluralistic and diverse. Like all religions, Islam has extremists, but they are few. Where violence and intolerance do exist in Islam, it feeds off local and historically particular circumstances and are not hardwired. Islam is capable of democracy. The West should acknowledge its own role in contributing to violence in Islam and engage in a dialogue that it can increase the sphere of shared understanding. Are more nuanced views available? Of course. And my aim is to present one. Yet, it is remarkable to me how widely the debate follows these lines, not only on cable news and the like, but also in higher-brow publications like the New Republic, the National Review, the New York Review of Books, in the Weekly Standard, and yes, in Western in universities. I believe that scholars have a responsibility to shed light on public controversies. And this is the aim of my remarks, which are drawn from my book manuscript, Religious Freedom in Islam, Intervening in a Culture War. I wish to take a close look at Islam with respect to claims that it is either a violent or a peaceful religion, oppressive towards outsiders and dissenters, or tolerant. The same question can be fruitfully posed towards any religion, or for that matter, secular ideologies or states or other communities. But I want to ask the question with regard to Islam because it is so contentious in our political conversation and because there are important stakes in it. It matters for the foreign policy of the United States and other Western states, and for the larger set of cultural attitudes that vitally shape relations between the West in the Islamic world, including Muslims living in the West. And I want to pose as a criterion for getting at this question, the principle of religious freedom. Why religious freedom? Many scholars have proposed democracy as the criterion and assessed Islam's compatibility. Democracies and elections and popular rule, though, coexist perfectly well with intolerance towards religious minorities and dissenters, the tyranny of the majority, Others have invoked tolerance as the criterion. But tolerance is temporary, like a truce, and is not founded on a deep, principled basis. Religious freedom, by contrast, is principled and permanent. <coughs> when a community adopts religious freedom, its members agree enduringly to respect the full citizenship rights of those whom they disagree over the ultimate questions. Today, some critics of religious freedom argue that the standard is a Western one and should not be imposed on the rest of the world. I have argued, by contrast, that religious freedom is a universal human right, consonant with its appearance in the major international conventions. Is Islam hospitable to religious freedom, then? Different methods for answering this question might be adopted. Islam's founding text, the Quran and the Hadith, could be examined. The tradition of Islamic thought could be plumbed. Or we might look at Islam as a whole around the globe, noting, for instance, the rise of Islamic terrorism since 1980. An excellent index for assessing religious freedom has been developed by Pew Research Center scholars Brian J. Grimm and Roger Finke. Their government restriction index scores the laws and policies of 198 states and territories on a scale of zero, <coughs> meaning most free, to 10, meaning least free, 
based on a battery of 20 questions that measure particular dimensions of religious freedom. Based on these scores, Pew divides the world's countries into four categories of restrictiveness. Very high, high, moderate, and low, as you can see on, on, the, on the chart. So again, very high is most restrictive, least free. Low is most free. And you can see the range of the number of countries that are found in each of those um, categories. And then the kind of range of scores that, that correspond. Now, this is, this is the whole world. But what if we look at Islamic, uh, at Muslim majority countries? Countries where Muslims are a majority of the population. There are 47 of these in the world. And this is my method of looking at religious freedom, is to look at Muslim majority countries. I think that this is a good test, because in these countries, Muslims have the popular power to deny religious freedom if they want to. So is Islam free in Muslim majority countries? And that's a good way to answer this question, I think. So 47, there are 47 Muslim majority states in the world. And if you take a satellite view, looking at the landscape, the picture seems to favor the more hawkish perspective. Of 47 Muslim majority states, 35, or more than three quarters, have high restrictions on religious freedom. And if you look at them as a whole, the set of Muslim majority states is far less religiously free than the global average or the set of Christian majority countries. I think that comparison because Christianity is the other religion that is, you know, the same ballpark demographically and spread out across the globe. So advance, please. <clears throat> zooming in from zooming in from a landscape view to a close-up view, however, if we look more closely at these countries, the picture starts to look more diverse and hopeful. It becomes apparent, for instance, that 11 out of 47, or nearly one-fourth, yeah, thanks, that's good, um, nearly one-fourth of Muslim-majority countries have low restrictions on religious freedom, according to the Pew Index, and can thus be judged religiously free. That's the first line there. Low restrictions, there are 11 of them, 26%, about one-fourth, are religiously free. <coughs> Among the regimes that exhibit high levels of religious restriction, Pew's moderate, high, and very high categories, there's also complexity here because there is diversity in the reasons behind the restrictions. To understand this diversity, we must look beyond the numbers themselves to the manner in which religious freedom is restricted. Crucial is what we may call a regime's political theology, that is the doctrine of political authority, justice, and the proper relationship between religion and state that political and religious actors have. Among religiously unfree regimes in Muslim-majority countries, two very different political theologies can be found. One is secular repressive, where the state marginalizes Islam in order to build a modern society, and 15 regimes fit this description. The other is religiously repressive, characterized by an Islamist political theology, where the state imposes a strongly traditional form of Islam, and 21 <laughs> states fit this description. When regimes with a religiously free political theology are added to these orientations, a division of three kinds of regimes in Muslim-majority states emerges, and so we see much more diversity. Let us take a look at these three orientations a bit closer. Yeah, go ahead and advance. Consider first the 11 religiously free regimes in the Muslim majority world. Uh, advance again, please. Thanks. <coughs> Their governments are committed in principle to refraining from coercing or discriminating heavily against individuals and religious communities in the practice of religion. They adhere closely to the international human rights conventions. Their constitutions either do not mention Islam or else mention it in a sense that has little implications for law. Their constitutions contain robust provisions for religious freedom, allowing people and communities wide liberty to practice and express their faith, to educate their children in their faith, and to govern their communities and properties. They protect the liberty of Muslims who dissent from prevailing orthodoxies and of religious minorities like Christians, Jews, and Baha'is. 
In these states, Muslim religious leaders promote the vigorous practice of Islam, the spread of Islam, and a robust Islamic culture, while often enjoying direct state support for religious activities. But they're free. In other words, there's nothing that is secular about them. They can often be very religious, but it's religiously free. In a certain sense, religiously free states are secular, but this requires a clarification of this very uh, fraught word, secular. Pope Benedict XVI distinguishes between positive secularism, which involves a healthy separation of religion and state and robust religious freedom, with negative secularism, where the state, motivated by an anti-religious ideology, seeks to restrict, marginalize, and privatize religion. Most of all, in the United States here, we've had a positive secularism. And religiously free states are secular in the positive sense. Advance, please. It's kind of fun to say this. Uh, the, great, the greatest concentration of religiously free Muslim-majority countries is in West Africa, where they are found in Senegal, Mali, Niger, Guinea, Burkina Faso, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia. Lebanon is another interesting case. Most of the West African countries contain minorities of Christians and other faiths, and many of them Shia and Ahmadi communities who descend from mainstream Sunni Islam. This is the geographic heart of religiously free Islam. It offers the strongest existing evidence for the possibility of religious freedom in Islam. Importantly, these countries are free not despite or apart from, but rather because of their Islamic character. Prevalent in them is Sufi Islam, which strongly stresses the free character of faith and the presence of God in every person. Sufis often appeal to the verse that Mustafa quoted, Quran 2, 256, there is no compulsion in religion. And they don't add anything else to it. They just leave it the way it's supposed to be read. They refrain from labeling anyone an apostate and even defend a right to exit Islam. Dating back to the 14th and 15th centuries in West Africa, Sufism is arguably the most important shaper of the regime's unusual degree of interreligious harmony and tolerance, and more broadly, the commitments to freedom in matters of faith that form the political theology that underlines governance in these regions. Now, within the last five years, Islamist groups, some of them Salafi, have grown in most of these countries, often influenced from the outside, and in some cases committing violence and terrorism. All of these countries, though, have maintained their high levels of religious freedom. Advance, please. The second orientation of Muslim-majority states towards the governance of religion is based on a political theology of secular repression. The political theology of secular repression runs something like this. We are a modern state that is headed for greatness. We will develop a modern economy, and everyone, yes, everyone, boy or girl, regardless of caste or class, will receive an education. We will advance in science, technology, and military might. European states have shown us the path to the future, but they will no longer be our masters or colonizers. This progress requires keeping religion in check. Our citizens may practice religion if it gives meaning to their lives and makes them more virtuous, that's fine, but religion will not define our public life. Religion is irrational, superstitious, and the source of hierarchies that impede equality and direct people's pursuits away from this world and its endeavors and their loyalties away from the state. Perhaps religion can become more serviceable to the public wheel, but it must be reformed and modernized and thus will require oversight and governance. Advance, please. Typically, Islamic secular repressive rulers will establish a moderate version of Islam by supporting it, commending it, and closely controlling the governance of mosques, seminaries, universities, and schools. The content of curricula, the public expression of religion, the architecture of buildings, and even the dress of their citizens. They will simultaneously suppress more traditional and radical forms of Islam, preventing its clerics from holding positions of power, and if necessary, jailing them, torturing, or killing them. Secular leaders will present these religious figures as enemies of the state and use them to make the case for authoritarian rule. It's either me or the Muslim Brotherhood, Egypt's Hosni Mubarak, what I would say to his critics. The prototype of this pattern is in the Muslim, in the Muslim world is the Republic of Turkey, founded by Kemal Ataturk in 1923. 
After World War II, several Arab states adopted the model, the most influential of these being Egypt, but also including Libya, Morocco, Jordan, Syria, and Algeria, Iran, embodied the pattern under the Shahs of the Pahlavi dynasty up until the Shah's overthrow in 1979, as did Iraq under Saddam Hussein up until his overthrow in 2003. Indonesia was a secular repressive state under the dictatorship of Suharto from 1967 to 1998. Still secular repressive regimes are the Soviet republics of Central Asia, including Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, <coughs> Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Azerbaijan. The stands. Advance, please. Thanks. <coughs> oh, so here's the map of um, a secular repressive majority, Muslim majority countries where they're located. Advance again, please. The third and final orientation is a religiously repressive one based on a political theology of Islamism, which calls for the government to use law and policy to promote a traditional form of Islam in all spheres of life. The family, the economy, culture, religious practice, education, dress, and other areas. Islamism originated in the first half of the century in the thought of intellectuals like Hassan al-Banna, Abu Allah Badudi and Sayyid Qutb, who called for a revival of Islam in the wake of centuries of decline due to internal moral, moral decay and external imperial domination, symbolized most vividly by the abolition of the caliphate by the newly established Republic of Turkey, which uh, Dr. Ahad just mentioned. Advance, please. Religiously repressive regimes contain strong constitutional provisions that establish Islam as the identity of the state and the source of law. They exercise strong authority in both supporting and regulating the Muslim religious community in their state, while sharply restricting <coughs> dissentive forms of, of Islam and religious minorities. Advance again. There are 21 of these regimes. The standard bearers are Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Iran, who both seek to spread Islamism far beyond their borders. Sudan and Afghanistan are strong examples as well. While most of these regimes are highly authoritarian, some of them are democracies, just as was said, whose electoral dynamics um, are democratic, but they favor religiously repressive policies, including Malaysia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Indonesia. Indonesia might at first seem like a strange choice to include in this category, because it is the world's largest Islamic democracy, has two large movements that espouse tolerance, and has a regime based on Panchasila, which recognizes six official religions. At the same time, however, there are numerous ways in which Indonesia's laws and government restrict minority religions, especially those not officially recognized, in which the Indonesian state empowers the Islamic groups and society. For these reasons, Indonesia ranks and pews very high level of restrictions on religious freedom. What does this division of three regimes teach us about religious freedom in Islam, the principle that I have proposed as a criterion for our present culture war? It shows that while there is a dartha of religious freedom in Islam, the hawk's point, Islam is not straightforwardly, straightforwardly responsible for the dartha, as does what have it. While Islamic, Islamist regimes make the strongest case for the hawk's view, even they are a product of modern times, formed through an alliance with the sovereign state, in many cases incubated in secular repression. Think about the Iranian Revolution in 1979, which was a response to decades of rule under a very secular repressive Shah, and often erected partly in reaction to colonialism. Thus, they are not merely a direct outgrowth of the Quran. <clears throat> Behind secular repressive regimes are principles imported from the West. Religiously free regimes, almost one-fourth of Muslim-majority regimes, are more than anomalies and show that religious freedom is possible and that religious repression is not the overwhelming story of contemporary Islam. So I hope there is both honesty and hope here. Now finally, uh, just a short word on the Arab Spring. I mentioned that the benchmark I have been using to assess religious freedom is the scores of the Pew Forum for 2009. I choose this date because it allows us to survey the landscape of Islam prior to the rapid changes sparked by the Arab uprisings. 
I wish now to say just a few words briefly about the Arab uprisings that began at the end of 2010 in Tunisia with the frustrated fruit, fruit vendors' self-immolation. What do they teach about Islam and religious freedom? Advance, please. Five years after, don't get too befuddled by the numbers. There's only two that I think are really important. I'll show you in a minute. Five years after the protest of early 2011, almost all of these uh, predominantly Muslim countries were not more religiously free. The dreams of the courageous people who first took to the streets, risking being trampled by the forces of a dictatorship, were largely dashed as well. And here I have a whole list of countries that in some way had unrest at the time of the Arab uprisings, where there was some degree of democracy movement in 2011. And I have the score, their freedom scores from 2007 to 2013, after it was over. Now that right-hand column, you'll notice two red numbers. Those are the only numbers of countries that ended up being you know, more religiously free than when the Arab uprisings began, Libya and Saudi Arabia. Libya ended up in a massive civil war. In Saudi Arabia, well, it was starting from a pretty low place in the first place. So the Arab uprisings really didn't advance freedom very much. <coughs> advance again, please. In the six countries where not just um, so a little bit of unrest, but uprisings took place, the uprisings succeeded in four. That means overthrew dictators. Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen and failed in two, Syria and Bahrain. In Syria, there's still a civil war going on, the government is still in place. In all but one of these three cases, Tunisia, democracy failed to advance. Islamic countries, along with a um, vast failure, so put together Islamic countries, along with a vast failure of religious freedom and democracy. Does such a correlation bolster the judgment that Islam is inhospitable to religious freedom? Here again, zooming in on the cases reveals a more complex picture. Hawks can explain part of this picture insofar as traditional Islamic forces obstructed freedom's emergence. To leave matters there, though, leaves a great deal unexplained. The secular repressive dictatorships that ruled Arab countries for decades bear much of the blame for the failure of religiously free democracy to advance. <coughs> decades of secular repression in Egypt, Libya, and Syria suppressed Islamic parties inclined towards, inclined towards democracy or religious freedom and drove some Muslims into violent and obstructive reaction. And when regimes in Egypt and Libya fell, left their gargantuan task of governance to parties with very little political experience. In Syria, a secular repressive regime persists and foments mutual antagonism with the religiously repressive groups who continue to dominate the rebellion. The fate of freedom in the Arab uprisings is complexified further, following my general argument, by the presence of Islamic proponents of religious freedom in some places. Tunisia's Inada party is the best example of such a party, one that had developed a commitment to democracy and religious freedom prior to the uprisings, was willing to enter into coalition with secular parties, worked to open up the system for religious participation in the wake of brutal secular oppression, and, this is very important, was willing to stand down when it lost the elections of fall 2014. That's the true test of a democratic party. Is it willing to lead when it loses? Though Tunisia's Pew, number, Pew numbers show a slight decline in religious freedom by 2013, I believe that religious freedom opened up more than the numbers show though is still compromised in significant ways. In each of the countries where major uprisings took place, there were also people and factions who stood for religious freedom on Islamic grounds. Indeed, I would argue that where parties or factions holding a political theology of religious freedom were relatively strong, democracy stood a much better chance, and where forces of secular repression and religious repression were relatively strong, democracy was handicapped. Religion matters, and religious freedom matters. This lesson yields both a source of hope and a call to action. If it matters to the fate of regimes that there are people under them who support religious freedom, then history is not just the byproduct of large processes or the allegedly hardwired character of world religions. 
People and their ideas matter. If that is the case, then we should urgently work to spread authentic Islamic arguments for religious freedom and to encourage courageous advocates like Mustafa Akul and Saeed Khan. Thank you. I love the slides. Oh, thank thank you. you. Okay. Well, I want to thank all three of our speakers. I think we're just going to. Uh, I have a few questions for discussion for maybe about ten minutes, and then we'll open up for Q and A from the audience. So just be just be patient. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear it? Hear me now? Hello? No. This one's on. Sorry. That's, if, you, if you didn't hear me before, we're going to. Uh, have a brief discussion among the, the discussions here, and then we'll open up for Q and A in about ten minutes. So, one one of the questions I would like to raise among our uh, panelists here is, um, well, first to thank you for uh, describing Islam. It's, it's great diversity, uh, culturally, politically, both historically and and globally today, um, but. I would like to raise the question of, of, of authority. Who speaks for Islam in that way? Um, it, do people rely upon the text, the teachings of the text, on scholars, on religious leaders, on practices? And I raise this question because um, one could say, with, within any religious tradition, right, we have the resources to be tolerant, or we have the resources to for to be a free society, but for whatever reasons, those are not being actualized at, or being practiced at that time. Um, and, and other elements in the particular traditions are instead are being co-opted. So I guess in, what I'm trying to ask in, in a sort of brief way is, how can you reinterpret a tradition as, as, as rich and as long as, as Islam so that it can be um, uh, still relevant to most people, but also be reformed in a way that, that we're talking about in, with, that's compatible with a free society. <clears throat> thank you for this, and thank th thanks for the fascinating talks after mine. Um, who speaks for Islam? Well, this is asking, like, who speaks for Protestantism? Nobody, probably, because there are so many denominations and churches, even, you know, there are different colors of it. Islam, especially for Sunni Islam, I should say. Sunni Islam is a bit like Protestantism in the sense that it doesn't have a central hierarchy like the papacy and Catholicism. Who speaks for Catholicism? Well, of course, the Pope and Vatican and the Holy See. And, uh, in, 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 in Islam, maybe Shiites are a bit like that because they're grand ayatollahs, authoritative in every living, you know, there's a living ayatollah in every era, so there are a few big ayatollahs, so you can subscribe to both. But in Islam, it's, it's, that, it's very diverse, and that diversity makes it very difficult, of course, to bring a common voice. You do have sometimes uh, Muslim scholars, Sunni scholars from different walks of life, from different countries, from different societies, come together and take a position. We've seen that, we've seen that against terrorism, we've seen that against Islamophobia, we see that, so, but still there will be a lot of uh, ideas, and, and that's why, one thing, in the modern era, this became more diversified in the Protestantism, like with the entrance of nations. Well, who speaks for Islam? Well, in Turkey, it's the director of religious affairs. In Malaysia, as I discovered, it's the Javi, the religion police, and Jakim, which is the religious department. So, but then in those countries, you will find individuals and groups which actually don't agree with the official interpretation. They may have their institutions of official. So it's a very diverse picture, and that's why one end of the spectrum is very liberal, pro, pro, progressive, and reformist, if you will. They would be espousing the Enlightenment kind of values that you would have. Not the French so that much, I would say, but the Scottish Enlightenment uh, that, that had, to, had towards religious freedom. Then on the other hand, you would have very authoritarian, repressive theologies. And in the middle, you would have a spectrum of people. That's, that's why it is hard. And, and of course, they will be always, all will be saying, I am representing true Islam. And so, because none of them would say, I'm not representing true Islam. So that's, when you look from the outside, it's a spectrum. Does this answer the question? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I think to answer the question, who speaks for Islam? Everyone. 
And I don't think one has to even be a Muslim anymore to go ahead and gain authority to speak about Islam. And part of this has to do with the change of agency. Uh, the good news about uh, looking at Islam, or looking at anything for that matter, is the democratization of knowledge. Uh, in an unprecedented way, people have access to the knowledge. I mean, you're literally a click away. The bad news when it comes to understanding which then represents an authentic voice within Islam, uh, the bad news is that there's a democratization of knowledge. I'll, and I'll, I'll give you an example. There may be one individual who is espousing uh, a very peaceful, uh, moderate, uh, compatible narrative of Islam. Uh, but because they don't have a beard, uh, because they don't rock some Arabic, uh, because they don't have what is seen as the look of religious authority, they may get cast aside. Whereas at the same time, uh, a, a, a civil engineer who was uh, the 52nd uh, son of a billionaire developer in Saudi Arabia can sit in front of a babbling brook with a Kalashnikov but speak in very poetic sounding Arabic and espouse holy war. And this of course is Osama bin Laden. Now what gives a civil engineer, all due respect to those who have civil engineers in their families, uh, the authority to speak on a theological matter as opposed to a cantilever bridge, I don't know. But the thing is that he has enough of a following because the illusion becomes real for people. Now, in today's world of globalization, technology, and mass communications, it doesn't matter about the credentials. It doesn't matter about people actually, unfortunately, spending time at universities and, and doing it the right way. It's about how many likes you have. It's about how many followers you have. And so when it comes to then who speaks for Islam, unfortunately, like with anything else, it's about who is really listening. There's also the challenge of displaced contextuality within the new borderless uh, realm of the internet. My Islam with a small I doesn't necessarily match up to Islam with a small I in Indonesia or in Pakistan or in Turkey or in Burkina Faso. But the problem is that people who are seeking an outcome-based so uh, solution to what is their issue will borrow or will take from a different place something that is bereft of contextuality. And ironically, this is the same problem that happens when we have the imposition of certain Western modern values on the Muslim world and, and other places. The Reformation, the 30-year war, the peace of Westphalia, all of these things came out of a very specific history of Europe. It is something that the Islamic world never had. Now, I was, uh, last week, I was invited to give a talk because it's the, 100th, uh, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Does Islam need a Martin Luther? And so the question I asked the audience is, I said, are you Catholic or are you Protestant? And they're like, well, why, why does it matter? I'm like, well, if you're a Protestant audience, then Luther is a hero. If you're a Catholic audience, then, you know, Luther's kind of a villain for splitting up the, the, the church. So when you're asking me the question, then if there's the need for a, uh, a Muslim Martin Luther, that would be question number one, what does my audience want? And second of all, I'm going to go ahead and say, well, what exactly did Luther reform that you want to have reformed in Islam? And third of all, what was going on in Europe was something that never happened in the Muslim world, the tension between religious and political authority. So, Contextuality really matters as well. Now the problem is that doesn't fit within 140, or I guess what it is now, 280 character tweet. Uh, this, this takes some nuance and some complexity to try to uh, work through. Thank you. I just have one, uh, one more question, then we'll open it up for Q&A to the audience. Um, and this is for Professor Philpott and the others as well. Is, uh, on your presentation on the principle of religious freedom, which I thought was very convincing as a way um, as sort of the best way to measure democracy and or compatibility between religion and democracy. Um, I'm curious though, uh, what you and the other panelists think are some of the obstacles uh, specifically for the Islamic countries to have that principle realized in practice? Um, and certainly there, there may be state factors and the legacy of colonialism and, and other things, but I'd be curious um, what factors do you think are most important for, um, for these Islamic countries to sort of realize the practice of religious, religious freedom? Well, it's a very good question. And I think, unfortunately, in um, 
you know, many of the countries you have uh, where you know, religious freedom is repressed, you also have a dictatorship. There's general repression. And so there are authoritarian rulers who have a kind of uh, stranglehold on the country. And, um, you know, it's not exactly clear whether there can be you know, immediate change. I do look at, um, there are some kind of broad factors that uh, tend to be corrosive of dictatorships. Um, one is economic growth and one is um, education and growth in education and literacy. These are both things that I think ultimately uh, put pressure on um, authoritarian rulers. I would also say I'll, there, there are also a few countries where you have a lot of kind of restrictiveness on religious freedom, but they're democracies like Indonesia, um, Bangladesh, Pakistan. And here, I think that there can be some role to play um, through, um, through international pressures. And uh, because there is a kind of openness and um, criticism through which one can work. It's, um, but it's a ginger process. For instance, um, I've been at conferences where Pakistanis um, don't want to speak too openly against their country's uh, blasphemy laws because they think that they'll be um, you know, prosecuted when they go back home. Yes. One argument we routinely face in the Muslim world when we advance religious freedom and the idea of freedom in general is that it is a pretext for Western colonial designs or Western aggression or double standard and so on and so forth. And that in itself is a dictatorial argument. You know, it's just an argument actually to keep some authoritarian structures. But the West sometimes might be feeding into that when it really sometimes uses religious freedom as a pretext for not an honest criticism based on a value, but some political designs. Or when the West overlooks religious freedom problems in a country whose foreign policy might be helpful, whereas you know, religious freedoms in a other country whose foreign policy is distasteful becomes much more highlighted, yeah. then people have the perception that this is just a strategic game yeah. Western capitals are playing. They are sometimes playing that. And I think we should disassociate the commitment to religious freedom and freedom in general from the petty politics of, I think, the West. And the more the Western is, the West is able to do that, the more people like us will have a broader, I mean, have a stronger base to argue that we need religious freedom and that's not an imperialist agenda or something. That's a value that we should also subscribe to. Which, which, in our roots, which yeah. was something that was exploited, I mean, that, and led to the dismantling of the Ottoman Empire when yeah. uh, external forces were exploiting religious communities and minorities within the Ottoman Empire saying, we're going to defend them, we're going to protect them, and use that as essentially an inroad to then uh, exert what kind of encroachment they wanted in order to weaken the Ottoman Empire. I think it's important to recognize, though, that in many of these conflicts, Religion is not the only identity that is attached to these various communities. There's also an ethnic component. So when you're looking at a place like Malaysia, for example, there's three major religions that are represented there. There's Hinduism, there is Buddhism, and there is uh, an Islam. But the Buddhists are all uh, invariably Chinese, the Hindus are invariably Indian, and the Malay are invariably Muslim. And so it's important to understand that ethnocultural differences sometimes get uh, redeployed as religious differences. And this happens within uh, Islamic communities as well. Case in point, when you're talking about that wonderful gift that keeps on giving the issues in the Middle East, that uh, the framing of this is seen as sectarianism. It's the Sunni versus the Shia. And then it's taken out one concentric circle level to say, well, it's the Saudis who are Sunni and it is the Iranians who are Shi'i, and their real uh, conflict is one based on sectarianism. <coughs> But if you peel the, uh, the la uh, layers of the onion a, a bit uh, further back, you then start getting into these anomalies, like the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, meeting with a firebrand Shia cleric in Riyadh saying, basically, Red Rover, Red Rover, why don't you come over? And you then understand that this isn't really about sectarianism. It's about culture. Because not only the Saudis certainly are Sunni, but they are also Arab. And the, per the Iranians are not just Shi'i, they are Persian. And what you have here is essentially a, a turf war for cultural and as well as economic political influence, which is being reduced to a sectarian issue. And so right now, why are they uh, meeting and trying to court and recruit a, a Shia a cleric with whom they have nothing in common theologically? 
because he's Arab and they want to go ahead and drive that wedge and say, we may be Sunni, but you're with us because you're Arab, you're not Persian. So you see these complexities, and even for people who you know, spend a good amount of their waking hours trying to analyze these, that's a moving target. Thank you. I think we'll open up for a Q&A from the audience. Do we have a microphone? We do. I got a mic and yes. I'm locked out because Professor Takarov has a question. He's right next to me. But those of you that have questions, I'll raise your hand and either get Lee's attention or my attention, and I'll get the mic to you. The mic is optimal simply because we're recording this, so that way we can have your, your question uh, on the recording. So again, uh, try to use the mic. I hand it to Professor Talkrup, and I got Professor Boris, and then after that, I'll start running around. So here we go. Okay, well, thank you for the very interesting uh, details concerning uh, culture and politics in those predominantly Muslim countries. You gave us a lot about Islam with small i, but the title had Islam with a capital I, as far as I understood. So could you help us uh, by directing us toward uh, what doesn't change over time? Culture changes and politics changes even faster, but what's non-negotiable and what doesn't change are the holy texts of each religion. So in Islam we have the Quran, what is it about the Quran, specific texts, specific places where we can find out why some people think Islam is incompatible with liberty and others claim that it is compatible with liberty? We only heard one quote about religion uh, from the Quran that there is no compulsion in religion. Can you give us uh, other texts on both sides of this argument? Sure. Thank you. Can I? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, one thing I should underline is that the Islamic tradition we have at hand today is first based on the Quran, which has not much to say on many issues that we're discussing today. Then come then the Hadiths, which are sayings attributed to Prophet Muhammad, which is a much larger coll collection, which has a lot more <coughs> things in it. It's a huge body of information. Then. The interpretation and the, uh, of the Quran and the Hadith by medieval jurists who created their own jurisprudential schools, which that's why Sunnis define themselves as Hanafi or Maliki or Hanbali because they subscribe to certain schools. So the Quran is silent on most issues that you can discuss when you discuss about some political stuff today. If you look at the Quran about the caliphate, for example, you will not find the word you'll find it only as a theological concept, not as a political concept, because the caliphate is a post-Quranic construction, for example. But on religious freedom, there are, I would say, strong grounds within the Quran for religious freedom. I mean, no compulsion, no compulsion in religion, is just, is just one of them. There are other verses. I can't name the number, but I can quote the verses. Like, the truth is from your Lord, let anyone who want to believe it, believe it. Let anyone who want to disbelieve it, disbelieve it. Uh, to you, your religion, and to me, mine. So these are Quranic verses, and I can send you a whole set of those if you want. There are verses in the Quran that imply, that actually stress that religion should not be coerced and it should be a matter of free decision. However, these verses have been rendered less effective. Their limitation has been minimized by later interpretation, which look at some later verses of the Quran, which, which speak about <coughs> confrontation between the Muslim community and certain groups, infidels, these are typically pagans in the region, pagans of Mecca, which were the arch enemy of Islam. In the, because Islam was ba mainly a battle of monotheism, a battle cry for monotheism in a pagan society. So there has been wars and battles. Th there are some texts in the Quran describing those battles and says, be steadfast and fight the enemy, fight the unbelievers, and so on and so forth. They typically target the pagans. There are a few verses between uh, three verses of conflict between Jews and Christians as well, whereas there are positive things to say about Jews and Christians as well. The Islamic tradition, which was a mistake, according to me and some people who look at this from a more reformist point of view, abrogated some more tolerant, pluralistic, or freedom-promoting verses, or minimized their scope, by thinking the, letter, the later day verses about conflict 
somehow overrides them. Whereas I would say the conflicts were limited in scope and the conflicts were limited in context, whereas the earlier verses of the Quran gave us the principles of Islam we should uphold. So this is a matter of interpretation. But I should say some of the hot issues when we speak of uh, religious freedom and when you look at the Quran, you won't find any, any issue there. Apostasy. The Quran says nothing about punishing apostates. It's not in the Quran. It's in the Hadith and it's in the interpretation of the Hadith by medieval jurisprudence. And that's why we can easily argue against that interpretation. Uh, stoning of adulterers, you know, which happens, it's not in the Quran. I mean, th there is no stoning in the Quran. There are b uh, verses about some battles, and I think they have been quoted saying that, oh, Islam orders the killing of uh, non-Muslims, quoted out of context, sometimes by the terrorists themselves. <laughs> it is just like going to the Old Testament, finding certain passages in the book of Joshua, uh, and to say, yes, the Old Testament com commands murder and so on and so forth. Whereas most Christians and Jews would tell you, well, that tells you a certain historical episode and that doesn't give you a blank check you know, for religious militancy. Although not all Christians and Jews thought like that in history. So I should say, I I'm a M Muslim which very much believes in going back to the Quran, taking it as the only undisputed source but also, also understanding the Quran in its own historical context and, in, and like extracting from the Quran some liberal principles, which I see there. I see it in the verses that really emphasize that it's, religion cannot be coerced, and they are there. And I think the people who try to override those verses by abrogating them or by putting insertions into parentheses as the Saudis or Malays are doing, are actually depriving Muslims from some of the more pluralistic the notions that the Quran has. One more thing, for example, who is going to be saved? Who goes to heaven? Ask this to a typical scholar from Saudi Arabia or Malaysia conservative. They'll tell you, of course, only Muslims go to heaven, right? The Quran doesn't say that. There is a very powerful verse in the Quran which says, believers from within Muslims and Christians and Jews and the Sabians, Sabians were, was another religious group at the time, Anybody who's in these communities who believes in God and who has good deeds will be saved. So that's in the Quran. But the Muslim tradition wanted to, you know, not accept that and limit it because they want to say we are the only Muslims who are saved because people want to praise their own community at the expense of others. So there's a lot of there are a lot of layers of interpretation, some of which which is not necessarily wrong, but we, th that we should go back and question. Does this answer your question? I hope. Do you have any? Anyone else? Uh, yeah, just very briefly. Uh, you know, so the Quran in many ways, I mean, these principles are derivative. There really are no headings and subheadings in many of these cases that are going to help. But just one example that I think perhaps hopefully goes to the heart of this. It shows a relationship uh, regarding religious freedom that is irrespective of the involvement of the state. And that's within the family. And in Islam, a Muslim man can marry a Christian or a Jewish woman without her being compelled to convert. She can retain her religion. So uh, a more profound example of religious freedom, I'm not sure exists, that within the family unit, and again, irrespective of whether one lives in a democracy, a monarchy, a, an oligarchy, a kleptocracy, or, or what have you, uh, this fundamental unit of, of society, you have that level of religious freedom. And, and look, the, 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 the woman of the household essentially guides the religious rudder of the household. So she is going to then be encumbered with that role as to making sure that the progeny are well taken care of in their, in their spiritual needs. But the fact that that kind of deference is given regarding religious freedom of the, of the woman, uh, I think is a testament to then how the meta, the capital I Islam, views the issue of religious freedom. Thank you. Another question.
I understand the, the question correctly, it's why is it that in Afghanistan and other parts of the world, um, why was is Islam seen as a convenient uh, ideology or worldview to latch on to for um, uh, terrorism and other acts of violence? Mm -hmm. Sure. One thing I should thank you for the question. One thing I should remind is that th this level of extremism that we're discussing is a pretty new phenomenon. The world is discussing this since the 80s. Go back to 60s and 70s and 50s. Read all the Western academic and media sources about th problems in the world. They would be speaking of communism and other problems, but there was nothing about Islam. Islam was not this much politicized in these regions. So this is a very new recent phenomenon. It has some roots in the, in the past. I, I'm not going to tell you they have nothing to do with Islam, as some people say. They have something to do with Islam. Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they have something to do with Islam in the sense that these are the <coughs> most ultimate <coughs> fanatics in the Muslim world, which is a huge spectrum between people from more liberal to mild to conservative and ultimately it goes to the other end. So they are the ultimate fanatics. And ISIS is so fanatic that ISIS considers Hamas as apostate, for example. So even Hamas, which is a terrorist group by US and Israel definitions, is too moderate according to ISIS. And Hamas condemns some ISIS attacks against Syria, saying this is too much even for us. So like you, you go on the spectrum, you come to the Khmer Rouge, if you will, like I mean, ideological spectrum. So, but these people are relatively new phenomenon. Uh, they refer to Islamic texts, but they go there and find whatever they can to mobilize militant action. They find a fatwa by Ibn Taymiyyah, a scholar in, you know, in, in, in the 12th century, to be able to kill civilians based on that, and whereas other scholars don't think that that's valid. And so, so these people are driven by anger first, and that anger you know, is also combined with a certain understanding of religion. That anger is combined with a very literalist understanding of religion called Salafism. So in the past 30, 40 years, we've seen this influx of Salafism, which is ultra-Orthodox, if you will, to use terms from a different tradition, and, and, a politic, and politically traumatized regions. Now, when people live in a traumatized region, traumatized because of a Soviet occupation, traumatized because of an ongoing conflict between ethnic groups, traumatized because of civil war, they tend to become militant and angry and take revenge and so on and so forth. And they go and seek texts and teachings that give them that vindication. This, is, this happens at the times of crises. It has happened in other traditions as well. It is happening in other traditions as well. Check what's happening in Myanmar. I mean, what do, you, what do we think about Buddhism, right? Buddhism is like a lovely religion and peaceful and all the night. There is a Buddhist genocide against the Muslims in, in Myanmar, Rohingya Muslims today, and the leading actors are Buddhist monks. Mm -hmm. There is a Buddhist monk defined by the Times Magazine as the Bin Laden of Buddhism. Well, mm. he lives in a political context, in a political culture, in which he understands Buddhism as not as love and, 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 and yoga and, you know, and, and that he understands as killing the Muslims and saving Myanmar from the Rohingya cancer. So this, so in, in times of crises, these things happen. And there's a crisis going on in the Muslim world today. It's a reaction to modernity. It's a reaction to oppressive secular governments, which sometimes makes people more radicalized. And it, to, to, we should see the problem. We should understand that it's using religious texts, and we should challenge that. But we will be making a mistake to think that this problem is definitive of Islam as a civilization. It is the ultimate fanaticism that has grown up. There are similar Islamic fanatic movements in history, the, the Habarij in the first century. They were the ISIS of. So they, there are th th these things emerge. They emerge in other religious traditions as well. Yeah, I was going to say um, so that uh, excellent answer at, to add that um, there are intellectual roots to this this violence, and I think um, I dated back to a movement I call radical Islamic revivalism, which emerges among in Muslim intellectuals in the 1930s, 1940s, where I think both of them. My colleagues mentioned the, the last caliph in uh, 1924, abolished by Turkey. It was very symbolic for many Muslims because 
as they looked around, they saw most, almost all of the Muslim world was now colonized by Europe. They looked back at a civilization that was once on the leading edge of the world, science, technology, learning, um, the arts, and so forth. But they interpreted Islam as having kind of descended into um, a great decline, or jahiliyyah, dar the darkness that preceded Muhammad. And they thought Islam was in a kind of crisis, both due to internal moral decay, but also to external imperial um, domination. And so there grew a kind of emergency mentality that said that it was time to kind of take up serious arms against this. And the intellectual who most mobilized that way of thinking was um, the Egyptian Said Qatam, eventually um, uh, executed by Nasser's uh, government in 1966. But I think that most um, of the kind of radical, you know, violent groups, um, including Al-Qaeda, um, I think can be traced back, you know, to this kind of thinking that Qatab is their grandfather in a way. And then these other thinkers sort of preceded him with this interpretation of, of crisis and needing to take emergency measures to kind of rescue Islam. Thank you. We have a question here and a question there. Yes. Um, Mr. Akhil, in your book, um, refer a lot to the Hadiths and the, uh, the reform or the attempt to reform the Hadiths at some point during um, the history of Islam. And you were referring to this sort of in, in the answer to uh, the first question that was asked. Next, my question is, um, I mean, the impression I got from the book was that you would like to see a lot of reform to a more progressive, more liberal-minded Islam. Um, and if well, the feeling I got was this would need to be done through the Hadiths. Um, how do you feel about this? <coughs> <coughs> Sure. Thank you so much for reading my book and interpreting it correctly as well. I should just say that the Turkish chapter is a little outdated. I should say tell you that. I mean, I was more optimistic about the Turkish experiment f five, six years ago now. Tunisia is doing better now, I should say. Um, uh, thanks. Well, there are many issues, I think, in Islam that we Muslims have to rethink. There are interesting medieval theological debates about the role of reason, and you know we minimize it and deny our own rational theologians. So there's a toll coming from that. There are, uh, you know, there are there's modern day radicalism coming from Kut, which added to all of that, which is all true. But if we if we gotta here's this thing: Islam has something that Christianity doesn't have, and that is that leads to a lot of complications and questions, and that is law, legal. Sharia. And I know Sharia is a toxic word in the West and because a lot of horrible things are done in the name of Sharia, I'm against those things as well. F Sharia can be something very beautiful and it just can mean divine justice To I follow the Sharia when I don't eat pork, for example, so it's, it's about personal observance too. But when it becomes about penal code, when it becomes about structuring a society, there are a lot of tensions between classical interpretation of Sharia and modern free open society as we understand them. Now, is Islam the only religion which has a tradition like that? No, there is another one which is very similar to Islam, which is Judaism. Judaism Ju the Judaic halakha is very much like the Islamic sharia. It's ac actually, sharia comes from the halakha, if you ask me, historically speaking. All the dietary laws, all the stoning comes in, all that, th th that was in what we would call the Old Testament and the Jewish tradition. Uh, of course, Christianity solved that problem by, you know, First with Jesus and then Paul, and I think we have a lot to learn from Jesus in that perspective by looking into the moral perception, moral lessons behind the law and literalism. But anyway, you have to question what Sharia means today. And when you do that, the roots of the sources of Sharia, most of it through the Hadiths. Why do you kill why do you want to kill apostates? Well, they say there is a Prophet Muhammad saying, kill the apostates. Well, this was written two hundred years later after he died. Is it really an authentic saying or not? I mean I'm having these debates in the past 20 years all across the Muslim world. So it most of the time boils to the Hadith because much of the Sharia is based on the Hadith. S some aspects of the Quran too, but the Quran has very little legal injunctions, very small number. Hadiths give you more. Now the thing about now the thing about Hadith is that if something is Prophet Muhammad's word, I will take it and I will respect it. Though not, no doubt about that. But there are two questions here. Did he really say this or did people imagine he said that? 
because these were written down 150 to 200 years later, several generations later. Secondly, did he say this in a certain context which made sense and which had a certain intention? Are we taking it out of the context today? Which is valid for the Quran as well. So how do you go forward in these issues? Well, you go forward by writing books, showing up on TV, having debates, because there's no, nobody else. I mean, in Turkey, there are reformist theologians, modernists, as we would say them. You know, they are on TV all the time discussing whether hadiths, all hadiths are authentic or not. They're saying our prophet couldn't have said this. This is illogical. This is irrational. It conflicts the Quran. So here's one view. There are other people who think like that. But in Turkey, I think a lot of at least public debate has happened on this and some some recognition that you know hadith should not be considered as the Quran has taken place. So it's gonna now? So, even now, because in Turkey right now the the ruling madness in Turkey is more about politics rather than directly theology, although you know religion is used for that as well. Uh, I mean we would need another lecture for that. But so how do you go forward? Well you go forward by scholars who have who, scholars, intellectuals who are willing to move forward and, and question, and the question in the way, not as a rejection of Islam, not as a rejection of the sources, quite the contrary, by claiming them, saying that we need to understand them today because maybe we have a misunderstanding them and so on and so forth. In my book, I tried to give some highlights of that discussion that's going on. So if I, if I may, uh, when we think of Sharia, and I think Muslims are oftentimes guilty of this as well, it becomes very reductive to what is their personal need. And I, I mean, I'm sure most people don't sit around waxing poetic and philosophically about the American constitutional uh, legal system. But just to give you an example of where some of the Sharia analysis is going right now, I have a former student who's at, uh, she's at Harvard Divinity School now. And her master's thesis is looking at the Islamic legal principles around the potential marriage to a cyborg. And you're like, wow, what are they teaching at Harvard? Uh, <laughs> oh, so much you don't know. Uh, for, for a lot of Muslims, this is going to be seen as an indulgent exercise or just a way to kiss up to the West. Artificial intelligence is going to have a paradigm shift on humanity. And one of the things that a student like mine is doing is being on the cutting edge of issues, and by the way, in many ways, uh, Islam is a slightly uh, late comer to this. I know some co uh, colleagues from Emory University who are already looking at the uh, halakha, the Jewish uh, 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 ramifications of this. And I don't know where Christian thinking is uh, on this. I know that uh, being at the Vatican in, in April, I know that they're starting to uh, take a look at this uh, issue. But the, uh, or at least some part of AI, maybe not marriage, because you know, marriage among priests you know. uh, but uh, the whole notion of having that kind of vanguard thinking uh, about a sophisticated legal system which allows you to do so n as a safe space, not one of being under penalty of blasphemy laws in Pakistan or apostasy laws in, in some other country. That was the organic, vibrant legacy of Sharia a thousand years ago in a place like Baghdad, as well as in a place like Cordoba. Because while Islam in, in, in the 21st century may have spawned a bin Laden, Islam in the 11th century spawned an Ibn Rushd who then influences both Maimonides and Aquinas. That's all part of Islam, and it's wrong to essentialize one over the other. We, I wish we had another uh, Averroes or Ibn Rushd. I wish we had 10 of them, uh, but uh, you know. Sharia was what, what protected your property from a despotic sultan who could have shook that. I mean, Sharia was the law of not the sultan, but something beyond him. So in that sense, yeah. it was a root of justice. And that, and that was the whole point that, that Locke didn't get, is that the, the, the sultan was bound by what the mufti said. The, the sultan in the Ottoman Empire could go ahead and pass certain laws, provided they did not go against the uh, mufti and his interpretation. They had to pass the laugh test. Then I should say this. Uh, one thing the Grand Mufti, we would call the Sheikh al Islam in Ottoman Empire, stopped in the Ottoman Empire was the forced conversion of Christians in the Balkans. 
The Sultan considered doing that. The Sheikh al Islam said that is unlawful, you cannot do that. So that was Sharia in that sense, granting religious freedom, because it was accepted in Islamic law that Christians can remain as Christians. Preserving religious freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Almost out of time, but we have time. One, one last question. Yes, yes sir. sir. One of the recent arguments I've seen against like Syrian refugees is that they do follow Sharia law, which would make it not able to live in our free society. I'm wondering how valid is that concern and should we actually worry about them? Like if they're coming here, would they actually be able to live side by side with them? <coughs> saying women aren't covering themselves. My girlfriend here, she's not covering herself. Would she be in danger of someone who's actually not accustomed to this? Yeah. So I think there's two oh, aspects of right. sure, there's two aspects of that. First of all, and I know this is going to be a dirty little secret for all of you, but uh, American law is 99% Sharia compatible. So there is, there is very little daylight in it. I mean, the only difference is it's not written in Arabic. Uh, otherwise, people would probably be really <laughs> upset. But I think, it speaks, <laughs> I think it speaks more to the question about what is the feeling of instability that we feel about our own American legal system that a few hundred or a few thousand refugees could subvert it. Ones who, the last time I checked, would not be US citizens right away, even if that was conferred upon them. And the last time I also checked, the Constitution was the supreme law of the land. And the mechanisms to change the Constitution, an amendment to the Constitution, requires two thirds of each House of Congress and three fourths of each state legislature. And if you haven't noticed, there's no way that people are going to have that level of agreement in the next hundred years, given the kind of gridlock that occurs. So I think we're pretty safe when it comes to that. But there is a chilling effect that people have that somehow the other, the Constitution can simply be changed willy-nilly in, in the country. Maybe it's because we don't watch Schoolhouse Rock anymore and we don't know how a bill becomes a law or, you know, the OJ trial really shook us from our very foundation. I, I don't know. Can I address very briefly? Thank you for bringing that up. I think that kind of Sharia alarmism is totally irrational, if you ask me. This is like saying Orthodox Jews cannot be American citizens because they follow Halakha law. Well, Orthodox Jews ha follow Halakha in the, face, in the sense that they eat kosher, they abstain from pork, they have certain, you know, they wear kippah, they, they observe the Sabbath. So a, a typical refugee from Syria will probably be that much of Sharia in that sense that maybe she'll be wearing a headscarf, maybe not. We both are fine, totally, of course, her choice. She, maybe she will want to, or he, or want to have go to Friday prayers. And because halakha or Sharia can mean your personal observance, and there's nothing wrong with that. That is religious freedom. Oh, if some Orthodox Jews say, let no Americans eat pork, then you would have a problem with that. But they don't say that. Most, the overwhelming of the majority of the Muslims will not say that either. They would say, I want to live my Muslim life in the way I understand that. There, there might arise some issues there. For example, in, in I think one of the US states, there was an issue. Some Muslims truck drivers said, we don't want to carry alcohol because it's against our religious belief. Now, that's a good question. And I think that's a religious freedom demand, again, that you should accommodate. If they said, Americans should not drink alcohol, Yes, you'll have a problem. Are they saying that? No. I mean, there are a few crazy groups in, in the UK which was supposedly bringing Sharia for the UK. They were imagining that alcohol will be banned in all the UK and all the statues will be... They were crazy people, like 50 people joining them. So there might be people who have that in their wildest dreams, but the people who come, especially as refugees, are just actually happy with the freedom and, and the openness and diversity they find here, and that should not be deprived from them. That would be very un-American, as I understand from America. Well, I'm not American, yeah. but... Well, well, but well, I mean, an Uber driver saying, I'm not carrying any, any alcohol in my car for religious reasons is not too different from, say, a florist or a baker saying, I refuse to bake a cake for a gay wedding on, on religious uh, objections. And it's one last comment is, um, uh, we talk about religious freedom and we talk about religious freedom in the Muslim world and so forth. I think it's also important to understand that in the United States in the last couple of years there has been a very sharp rise in attacks upon Muslims who, who live in the United States. And I think that it's very important to affirm that religious freedom, if we are living according to our own best traditions, also means respecting the full 
you know, citizenship rights and rights of um, Muslims to be here you know, re reciprocally. Thank you. On that fine note, we will, um, let, you know, we have a reception afterwards where we can talk and mingle with our speakers. Uh, but please thank, thank me for, um, thank our, our panelists for being here. Thank you. Yes, yes. Likewise.